Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, my name is Alex and today we're going to talk about building magic sign-in links using Spring Boot and Spring Security. The idea here is that you no longer need your password. Instead, you specify your username or your email address. Then the application will generate a unique sign-in link just for you that is sent via email. And once you click it, you're automatically authenticated and can use the application. Off we go, let's code. Before we start building this out, I want to quickly touch upon the requirements. So I wrote them down here. When we build these magic links, we have to make sure that they are cryptographically secure. So what does that mean? If we provide links using tokens that are not cryptographically secure, if you see multiple values, you would be able to guess additional values. And these links are the equivalent of passwords. So we have to make sure that they cannot be guessed. The second requirement is that they can only be used once. So once you have clicked the link, it should be invalidated and they should also be short lived. So that means after five minutes, these links should expire automatically. And there are a couple of ways we could pull this off, especially the expiration would be easy to do with Redis. But in this tutorial, we are just using plain old JPA to store links and then later invalidate them. Now let's go to the IDE. Quick look at the dependency. As usual, we're using Spring Boot version version three and there are more dependencies than usual. So we use um, the starter security, the starter web, the starter data JPA because we want to persist links. Um, I'm using Flyway to manage migrations and we're using the H2 database to store everything. I prepared a little bit of boilerplate code already because I don't want to spend too much time on these individual topics. So if you don't know how Flyway works, check my video about it. But let's quickly check what's in store. I have two migrations. The first one is creating the schema. So I have a user table and that is what Spring Security usually expects. And the same is for authorities. And then I have a tokens table and the tokens are the actual tokens that are part of the email addresses, right? So I have a created at timestamp. This is important so I can invalidate them later on because we have the requirement to invalidate them after five minutes. Username, uh, because we need to know who owns that token, like which user will be authenticated when that token is used and then the actual token value. And we go with Watcha 64. So I'm using 64 characters, which, which should be sufficiently secure as we will see. So this is really just uh, creating all the tables that we need. And then I have one script that is creating an initial user. So this user has the username hello at xgr.dev and it has a password. And as you might be able to tell, I'm using bcrypt and we will set everything up for this. And the password is just swordfish. And then I have one authority, which is all access. It's just inserted here. So this will just bootstrap the user for us. And in this whole example, I'm not going to use a user entity. We just use the user details, the interface from Spring Security, because this whole example is highly domain specific. It really depends on how you've set up security, um, how you've set up users. So I try to make it as small as possible so you can add your specific requirements on top of it. So let's start adding a few components. What I'd like to do, oh yeah, let's let's check this one. So I have one entity already, which is the, called the magic token. And this is for the table tokens, right? That's the one that I just shown you. So this is, this is just a plain entity. Uh, I just added all the individual fields, created username token, and of course did the override for equals and hash code. So this will look pretty similar uh, in, in your application, depending on how you set things up. So now let's add a first controller. Um, let's go with auth controller. I want to make this a rest controller as usual. And then I want to have one get mapping for slash me which expects the principal because we're using a secured endpoint here and it's returning a string. And all it does is say, hello, principal name. I uh, have to import the get mapping here. Let me just do this. So this is the endpoint that we want to test. And if we start the application right now, Spring Security would still generate us a default password, which is a UUID, but let's already override that um, because we want to use the user that I created in the database at this point. So we start with a security configuration and this is a configuration and we need just a few beans in here. So let's add a bean. I need to provide an implementation of user detailed service. So we have the user in a database, but now I need to get the user details, but I don't want to write this myself. 
most likely in your application, you will have something like that. But what I'm going to do is say users um, equals JDBC user details uh, manager. So this is an existing implementation that I can use the user details manager for JDBC connection. It has all the queries in here. You can see it implements user details manager and that extends the user details service. And that allows us to load a user by username, which will give us the user details. And user details is the interface that we will use in this whole tutorial. So I'm not gonna add a specific user entity or anything like that. Um, but this one needs access to the data source. Um, so we inject this here, data source, data source. And then we can pass this to the second constructor. Usually, you know, when you overwrite equals, you also have to overwrite hash code. And there's something similar for Spring Security. Whenever you add your own JDBC, not JDBC, your own user detailed service, you also have to provide your own um, password encoder. So let's do this. Um, this is a password encoder. And as I've said before, we're gonna use the bcrypt password encoder. Now, this little bit of config should now make sure that we use the user from the database, have the encoder and should be able to log in. So if we start the application now, let's do this. There we go, run the app. It looks good, there are no errors. And we can see it successfully applied to migrations, uh, which is also correct. So if we go to the browser, and if we go to the me endpoint, we are prompted to log in, which is okay. And I'm using the user that I've created in the migration file, Swordfish, there we go. And it says, hello at axgr.dev. So this means, well, let me make this a little bit bigger. So this means it all works. We can authenticate. So the user layer has been taken care of. Now we can build the magic link functionality on top of that. So let's go back to the controller and I want to add um, two more endpoints that we're gonna use. One is a post mapping. So this one, I want users to be able to post to the auth endpoint and this should trigger off the creation of the email and send it to them. So I call this login because it's in login attempt and let's also uh, create a data class, login request. And that has the username. The username is the email address in our scenario. So we can say, this is a request buddy request. And this is the login request. Um, no, we're not gonna return a string. I, yeah. We're not gonna return anything here at all. I want to make the link here and we uh, or create the link here and how this works We will see that in a second But there's one thing that I would like to do because what happens is we will create that link and it needs to be cryptographically secure So it might take a second not a second but a few milliseconds to generate that link and then also to send it out via email That might take some time. So I don't want to make this a synchronous call Instead, what I want to do is make this an async call. So users will always see this call succeeding. So this will return an HTTP 200. So users see this has succeeded. So if we have a front end, we could say, if you are an existing user of our application, you should get an email soon. We don't even want to give feedback on whether the user exists or not, because someone who's malicious could use that to figure out, okay, do I find an existing user? So we make this async so the user doesn't have to wait. Let's also enable async, otherwise it won't work. So we have an async endpoint here and we will implement that in a second. Um, but we need another endpoint, which is the actual get mapping with the link. So users should be able to go to auth and then we have the token in here and that token should be what we're gonna validate. I call this authenticate because that's the actual authentication. And we need the path variable, which is the token. And then I also request the request, HTTP servlet request and the response. And I tell you why in a second, but we need both of them and then authenticate. We just leave that for now because I want to implement a service that's taking care of all of that. So, but first of all, let's go back to the security config and make sure that these endpoints are accessible, right? Because this one requires authentication because we need the principle these two are actually public endpoints. So we have to change our security config. And the way we do this is by um, adding a security filter chain. So we add a bean, call this chain, call this HTTP, HTTP security. And that returns um, security filter chain. That's the one. And then we configure HTTP, authorize HTTP requests, requests. 
So I'm adding a matcher, request matchers for HTTP method post. Posting to the auth endpoint is allowed for everyone. And in an ideal scenario, you want to have rate limits in place for this one, but I'm not going to do this today. Request matchers for HTTP method get permit all. Any other request should be authenticated. And I also have to disable cross-site request forgery um, because otherwise I won't be able to post to the endpoint using the terminal in just a second. And then we return HTTP build. So what we did here is we're saying generally everything should be authenticated, but these endpoints and these methods are allowed without authentication. So we can post to auth, which we do to request a new email, and we can get auth slash the actual token. So these two should be public. And now the magic can begin because now we are implementing the service that is taking care of everything in here. So I call this magic service and that's the service annotation here. So what do we need? First of all, I want to have a function that is generating a cryptographically secure token. So here's what we want to do. We say token and that has a size on my like this 64, as I said. So it cannot be much more than that because right now in the database, I specified this to be a varchar 64. So I would have to change that if I want to have longer strings, but just for the time being, I allow this. So then we have to provide an alphabet um, with all the characters that we want to accept as part of the token. So I make this alphabet, private well alphabet. Yeah, that should actually work. It's funny that Copilot just uh, suggested that because I haven't seen that syntax before, but it makes sense. So we have lowercase a to z, uppercase a to z, and the number zero to nine. So these are all the characters that we're gonna allow. What we're gonna do is we iterate over that alphabet and just pick a random index and we just use that token then. We need some means of randomization. And what I'm gonna do is I create a secure random here. Secure random is cryptographically secure and it comes from the Java security package. Don't use just random, uh, Java util random, I think it is. Don't use that because that's not cryptographically secure. Users would be able to guess additional links and we wanna avoid that. I also create one instance here because it's uh, thread safe and usually a little bit costly to create. So that should be fine. And now we can actually create a token. So what I'm gonna do is return. Doing this for one, two size, iterating until I have the, the whole size available. Map alphabet random next in alphabet size. That should be correct. And I'm just joining to string with an empty string. So that should give me the token of 64 characters randomly picked from that alphabet. I can make this private because I will only use this within the service. So then we need a function to issue a token which is used by our REST controller. So first of all, we need to know who is the user that we're generating that token for. So what we need is some means of accessing our user. So I'm gonna go with the user details service and then I can say well, well user equals load user by username and it's not admin but it's username that the controller has to provide here so we have the username and then we can pass it so this will throw an exception if the user doesn't exist and we handle that exe uh, that exception in the controller now we can generate the token at 64 characters long and now we need a way of persisting the token and i've not created that yet because we have as you may recall we have the magic token which is the entity but I didn't provide a way of um, persisting or retrieving these tokens. So that calls for a repository and I'm adding this to this file here just to keep things a little bit more condensed. Um, I'm gonna go with a class token repository. I make it a CRUD uh, repository and that has the magic token. That's the entity and the ID is long. So this shouldn't be a class, but instead should be an interface. Mm, and there is one function for now, find by token. I'm adding this already because we need this token string gives me a magic token. So let's go back to the service and we need to inject the repository here. And now we can just call tokens safe a magic token. And I'm using Kotlin magic here, apply the username of the token equals the user username that we have just loaded. The token is the actual token that we have just calculated. And I wanna set a timestamp because later on we might delete it. So this is instant now. Instant needs to be imported. There we have it. So now the token has been stored and now we can send it. We sent we sent the token via email. And I'm not gonna add the mail integration because that would just take too much time. Let's assume there is just one 
uh, function here that's taking care of the mailing. Um, so let's do this string. What we're going to do instead is we lock the link so that we can see it and open it in a browser. So I'm adding a lock. Logger factory, get logger of this class. And then we can do lock info. That's not a string, right? That's a magic token here. I uh, want the token actually, not just a string. So we do the same here. I uh, need to get this. Um, call this just magic, mail magic. And then we can say, okay, magic token has username and the username has link and then here's the link and usually this is something that would come from the application property so it's aware of where's the application running behind the load balancer etc so i'm just hard code that here um of token so this means whenever we issue a token we should now see the full link in the logs so we can copy it to the browser and open it um, now let's wire up this call to our controller issue token and here we are so we're gonna first inject the service because it's not yet here. Private well service, magic service. And then what we can do is service issue token, request username. As I said, that call may throw an exception uh, and we're even asynchronous here. So it, it doesn't bubble up to the user, but what we could still do is um, just catch the exception here. Um, so let's do try. Um, catch cause exception where is it exception and we just lock error oh we don't have a lock here so let's quickly add a lock um private well, lock equals logger factory and we're doing the same getting the lock here and then we can lock an error fail to generate token for um request username I don't even care about the cost, just keep it clean here. So, but this is something that we should test at this point. So let's actually, let's start the application and see if that works. So application has started and now we need a terminal to actually issue a new token. So this is a post request to 8080 and then to the auth endpoint and it requests um, the username, right? So I can say username, let me write foo. So as you can see, that returns HTTP 200. So it looks like it has succeeded, but let's actually check the lock. And here we can see it failed to generate the token for foo. And the reason being that foo is not a user that we know, right? So if I go back here and if I use an existing user, like this one, it still says HTTP 200, which is because of the async call. But now it says, hello, XGR, the dev has link we have that link. Now let me actually copy that URL, go to Chrome, paste it here. And we can see that looks nice, right? So it's, it's empty. Um, we don't return anything useful here, but it has succeeded. So that means we got the link. We can see it here. That should be cryptographically secure. By the way, you could also have used UUID, um, uh, generating a random UUID, which is also considered cryptographically secure but I just wanted to illustrate that if you need longer strings, you could just do it like this. Okay, so this has worked. So we have the link, it is generated, we can open it. Now we need to validate it. Let's stop the application and we go back to the magic service because that's part of the service. And here comes the actual call for that. I call this authenticate with the token and we also need to request HTTP servlet request and the response. So why do I need requests and response here? Most likely you may not need this, but in this example for the authentication, once we have authenticated a user, they need a means to use the application, right? And in most of the applications having a RESTful API, you would return a JWT, which they could then use to just make additional calls. I don't want to implement JWT here because it's just way too much. What I want to do is once users are authenticated, I want to store the authentication in their HTTP session because I'm just using the browser going back and forth. So I'm storing the credentials, not the credentials, the authentication in the HTTP session. That's what we use today. We we first fetch the token. So we do tokens find by token, which is correct. That should give us now the token entity. And if the entity exists, so entity, so this is a fancy way in Kotlin of saying, if the entity is not null, then we do a few things. So now we need the user. So we can say 
users load user by username go away entity username that again might throw an exception but that's all fine we just keep doing this and by the way we're changing a few things here so this should be transactional um let me do this one let's spring if we have the user right at this point we know the token exists and we have the user we can authenticate them so i can tell this is uh say this is an authentication uh i create a username password authentication our users still have passwords right i added a password for my user so what i can do now is it's the user then we have their password and we have the user authorities so what this is doing here it's it's creating an authentication object that is considered authenticated. So this is no longer an authentication attempt, but it's a fully populated authentication. So this also means since we know the user is now authenticated, we're also bypassing the authentication manager, authentication provider machinery. We just create that authentication ourselves. And since we provide the authorities, this is considered fully authenticated. And now the question is, how do we store this? So um, we do it as per the, the documentation of Spring. Get access to a strategy to access the security context. And it looks like this, security context holder strategy um get context holder strategy so we're using that and as i said i also want to store the authentication in an http session so what we also need is a repository which is the http session security context repository so we need these two things i create them in here so we can use them we first get a context from the strategy and on the context we set the authentication to our authentication which we have just uh, created over here um i can make this bit shorter because of kotlin so then i set the context on the strategy strategy context equals context and then we save everything in the uh, session repository save context context and here's why we need the request and the response because it's tied to that so we save request and response there we go and finally um, because this is a requirement we have to tokens we have to delete the token delete by id and that's the entity ID. We know that's not null here because we've just read it. Otherwise we wouldn't be in that block. So I can just delete the token. Since we have multiple database calls here, I just want to make this uh, uh, transactional. And this is the whole authentication. So now let's go back to the controller. And actually this one now becomes service authenticate token request response. So it's time to run the app. Let's do this again. I'm starting the app and we go to the terminal. I create a new link for us to use. So we go back to the lock. I just copy the link and go back to Chrome. Now, let me paste this in here. This works. And now if I access the me endpoint, you can see I'm authenticated. And uh, this is my username and this is just coming from the authentication that we have provided. So this is how the whole flow works. We generate a cryptographically secure link it can only be used once because we delete it from the repository immediately afterwards. So the final piece that's missing is make sure that it expires after five minutes. So let's do this. And this is best done doing creating a job. So first of all, we go back to the app because we need scheduling and then enable it just here. Again, if there are questions that you have around scheduling, check my other videos around it. When we just enable it and then we can just write a class which is called token cleaner because that should clean things up it's a component and it needs access to the repository tokens token repository and then we have the scheduled annotation i'm using a cron trigger and i want this to run like every minute three four five six so every minute this job should run and what should it do? It should clean. So um, first we need to calculate the threshold, right? Um, let's do this because I every token has the created at instant. And now we need to calculate um, the threshold, which token should be cleaned. So what I can do is instant, instant now, which is the current time, minus not one hour, but let's say minus five minutes because that's the requirement. And here we delete it, but we cannot delete it yet because our repository doesn't have a function for that that we could easily use. So we go back to our repository here and create a new function that is delete expired, which gets the threshold, which is an instant, but we have to write a custom query. So a few things. So this is modifying. So we have to just apply this one and it's transactional 
and then it has the query. Delete, let's check if that is correct. Delete from magic token T where T created is less than the threshold, which is absolutely correct. So we can just go with that. We go back to the token cleaner. Now we can just invoke tokens, delete expired threshold. So let's quickly test this. Um, and I want this job to just run every second for now. And we change the threshold and we invalidate tokens after 10 seconds already. So, and then let's quickly add another logger, companion object, well, log equals logger factory. Where is it? Logger factory, get logger. And then we just log the number of tokens. So we said tokens, tokens, and we have tokens count. That should work. So let's start the application. So we can see it has started and we see there are zero tokens. So let's quickly create one using our endpoint. And we can see now there's one token and there's the link and we can see it has just changed to zero. So that means the job is running in the background and it's removing all the tokens that are no longer available. So this wraps up all the requirements. What we could do still uh, as a means of improvement right now, users can have multiple links, which doesn't make sense. So this could be improved. And also on the service level, what could also be done? If we fail to authenticate the user, we could throw an exception in the service and then propagate it to the user, showing them a 401, 403, any of these, or even a 404 if the link is not found. And that wraps it up for this one. So we achieved a lot. We've built cryptographically secure sign and links that can only be used just once and that expire after five minutes. So again, this is really just a very minimal example and it depends on your domain of where you're using it. As usual, I hope that was useful. If you have questions, please drop them in the comments down below. Thanks for watching, consider subscribing, and I'll see you in the next one.